And God's people said, Whew, amen. Good morning. How are you? How's everybody doing? This weather outside? Come on. It's worthy. The Lord gave it to us. It's a gift. It's a gift. I love it. I was at the coffee shop this morning. I saw a woman wearing Uggs. It's like, calm down, though. Calm down. I, mean, I know it's in the 60s, but we don't need to wear a fur just yet. But um, it, it's nice. I'm, I'm glad that you're here. Welcome into this place. We are, let me put you at ease. We are not a perfect church by any means, but we are a people perfectly loved by a God who put on flesh, who stepped in the midst of every single one of us, who showed us his nature in the form of Jesus Christ, who died for us so that we might know salvation, and that is something to rejoice over, amen? Amen, man, I'm glad that you're here. Yeah, come on, we don't have to hold Easter to just one day a year. We can always celebrate that. I, um, this, uh, this, this week, I got an opportunity this past week to go to Nashville, Tennessee. Ever been to Nashville? Oh, come on, man, that city, let's talk about that. Like people just riding bicycles. It's like a moving bar. It's the weirdest thing I'd never seen. It was strange. But anyway, I got to go to a, a conference. There were a couple, talk about a, a, a diverse crew. Bob Swan with the youth department was there and Brent Parker uh, kind of tagged along with me and we went to this conference together. It was so nice to just kind of get away and, and, and not look at emails. Surprise, like nothing fell apart. The church is still, like, praise the Lord. You can step away. By the way, you can step away from things like that. And the world just keeps spinning and turning and had a great time. It's great to be poured into. And, you know, the funny thing about me and Parker together, Brent Parker is our, our, our campus pastor at Wood Forest. And, you know, he is like, he's like a coach. He knows all things sports. I know nothing about sports. That's like his love language, right? Um, so he's, every, but, but I'm not bragging, but with technology, Zippo. Man, that guy knows nothing about technology at all. And um, I told him, I said, all right, so you know what, let me handle, we didn't rent a car, you don't have to rent a car, right? You can do this thing called Uber or Lyft. How many of you have ever done that before? Man, I'm telling you, like, it, 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 it's crazy, and, and it's always exciting and sometimes terrifying. So I was, um, we were coming back, it was Friday, the conference was over, the conference ended downtown Nashville at like noon on Friday, our plane was flying out at three. So we go back to the hotel, they were holding our bags. We, we get our bags and, and I, I'm like, Parker, let me get this. So I, I signed it up and, and flagged our location and I saw that our driver's name was Jeanette. Great, 4.8 rating, Honda Accord, fantastic. So she pulls up and she's there and you know, look, you know, you don't wanna just jump in a stranger's car, that's scary. So I just made sure right, we matched out and, and I got in the front seat and Parker sat right behind me in the back seat and the first, the first impression that I had of Jeanette, don't judge me, but she wore these like great big sunglasses, like old school Elton John sunglasses. They were huge and I didn't know if she was being funny but I think she really liked them, so that's great. Really dark, I couldn't really see her face very well. But we get in the car and she's like zipping along and, and we're kind of making small talks. She gets on the access road and here we are, we're on the interstate heading to the airport going about 75, 80 miles an hour. And I asked Jeanette, I said, so what's your story, Jeanette? What's your story? It's always fun to ask people that question. And I'll never forget, she, she says while she's driving down the interstate, would you believe that recently I was diagnosed as being legally blind? Parker, who's sitting behind me, reaches and like grabs my arm. I still have his finger bruises right here. He's like, what? Text my family, didn't know. I just went, hey, I love you so much. Don't ever forget that. <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> and I just like, I kind of interrupted her. I said, Jeanette, here's what I need from you. I need you to just cut through straight to the point that says you can see fine right now because going down the interstate, <laughs> and she said, oh, well, I guess, yeah, there's a little more to the story. She said, you know, um, about four years ago, I had a condition, and I started losing my eyesight. And she said, I was involved in this church, and I just, you know, I kind of knew of the Lord, but I didn't know the Lord really well, but when I got this condition, and I, and I started losing my eyesight, and I was blind, she said, the church, just the, the prayer team just surrounded me, and they started praying for me, like they laid hands on me. And she said, I can't explain it, but something supernatural happened. And I could see. And she said, you know what? That changed my life. And she said, it opened my eyes to this awareness that there are people all around me in Nashville, and she said greater, all around the world, that maybe they're not physically blind, but she said spiritually, 
They don't see that there's something greater. They don't see that there's hope. They don't see that God is doing this amazing thing. So she said, I gave my life to the Lord. And here's what I do. She said, I'm a singer. And she said, I really, you know, the, the side money for this job is kind of nice. But she said, for the most part, she said, over the past two years, I've made over 4,000 trips in this city. I've gone to 4,000 different locations. I've picked up 4,000 different people. She said, I picked up the woman who had been abused and was leaving her husband. I picked up the man who had lost his job and was despondent. She said, I've picked up some of the saddest situations, some of the hopeless people you can imagine. And they get into my car, and when I ask them where we're going, they're like, just drive. I have no idea. And she said, I take that as an opportunity to point people to the glory of God and how God is still in the business of bringing light amidst dark situations. <laughs> like the church of Jeanette. It's just amazing. I just sat there and I just listened to her just lay out the beauty of the gospel and it was just incredible. She didn't know what I did. She had no idea. I hadn't even gotten to that part yet. I didn't well, let me tell you about me. I'm just sitting there like, all right, Mother Teresa, this is amazing. And I told her, though, I did say, I said, you know, I speak to a couple people every weekend. <laughs> and I, I, I would love to share your story. In fact, I said, Jeanette, if you want to, like, just go past the airport and just drive straight to the Woodlands, Texas, I'd love to give you a chance. And she looked at me with those big glasses, and she said these words, you can't afford me. So, okay, <laughs> all right. So, you know, isn't, in my conviction, isn't that who we're called to be? Think about that. Isn't that who we're called to be? Is, is, isn't that like truly, if we as the church know the good news that Christ has died, he's risen, and he'll come again, and, and we have the, the hope of the gospel, there's something about we're just not very fully present with one another. Like I, I, I kind of got on the plane and I just sat in the midst of that moment and I just thought, praise the Lord, you know? She doesn't have an MDiv, she doesn't have a seminary degree, but, but she is preaching and she is reaching people in such a powerful way. So if I accomplish nothing else as your pastor in my time here at the Woodlands United Methodist Church, I wanna be able to say this, that I was able to empower you, that I was able to tell you, get into the word deepen that relationship with Jesus Christ, and then let's not keep it here, but let's be a people that we're intentional about taking hope into lives and situations that just may be hopeless, amen? That's who we're called to be. So I just wanted to share that with you, so good. Can I open this up in a word of prayer and then we're gonna climb into Joseph's story. Woo, it's good stuff today, let me pray for us. Father, I'm, uh, I'm so thankful for this opportunity that I have to just be in the midst of family. Lord, I thank you for the perfectly imperfect church. Lord, I know that you meet us at this intersection of our, of our messiness and our slips and our falls, but yet God, the mystery of the gospel is that there's redemption and you're still in the business of making beautiful things out of the dust. So I pray for my friends in the space today, for those that just may be listening to this on a podcast, wherever they may be, that Lord, you would just, as we open up your holy word today, as we look at the story of Joseph, that, that God, the mystery of what you do through the power of the Holy Spirit, every single time we open up the word, is that it's alive. Scripture says the word is alive, it's active, it's sharper than any double-edged sword. So where the enemy has just allowed us to kind of believe the lies that, um, uh, that were hopeless, that were defined by our sin, by our mistakes, by our past, Father, I pray that your word today, the sword of your word, would just cut through, would penetrate anything, any chains that the enemy has placed around any one of us today, and that we would find freedom. Because Lord, you see us, you do. And Lord, I believe that you, you are here, you're working in ways that we see, and you're working in ways that we don't, so may we glorify you. Father, use me, speak through me, if not through me, in spite of me, so that your will and your words can be heard, and it's in your name that we say, amen. All right, would you open up your Bibles, if you have your Bibles with you, I'm gonna be in the book of Genesis chapter 39 today. We're in this uh, incredible story, looking at the life of of uh, Joseph, and I tell you, you know, I said it last week, Paul says in the book of Romans, the thing about scripture that's so beautiful, like we go back when we look at these stories in the Old Testament, um, and we see how people endured. 
how people were able to work through incredible moments of adversity, Paul says that it breathes hope. It gives us encouragement in whatever situation that we we find ourselves in today. And, And this is the story of Joseph. I was just talking to Susan earlier this morning, and this is a crazy story. Like last week, I I spoke from Genesis 37. We talked about dreams, right? We know that, that God gave Joseph this amazing dream. He didn't understand it. He knew at some point later on in his life that his brothers, that his family would bow down to him. He's 17 years old. He's telling his brothers. He's telling his father. I don't think he's being boastful. I think he's just saying, I don't know what to do with this. And we know that he was favored. We know that his father, Jacob, gave him this coat of many colors. Didn't really help the situation between he and his brothers because his brothers hated him because of that coat. They hated him because of his dreams. And what happens? They seize an opportunity when dad is not around to take Joseph, to strip the coat off of his body and to throw him into a well where they will eventually sell him into slavery. Sometimes when God gives you a dream, the people closest to you don't always understand it. God's dreams that he breathes into our hearts, they're not always accepted by other people, are they? But what we talked about and where we landed last week was this truth, that the world can strip our coats off of us, but it can't take away the call that God has placed inside our hearts. And that's where we landed last week. Now, the rest of the story that I didn't get to was the fact that, you know, his brothers would then sell him into slavery, They would take that coat of many colors, they would rip it up, they would shred it up, they would find an animal, they would kill it, they would dip that coat in the blood, and they would take it back to their father who loved Joseph, and the brothers would say to Jacob, hey, um, we're so sorry we found this, we're pretty sure that your favorite son is dead, he's been killed. So imagine that, Joseph's father, not knowing that Joseph is alive, not knowing that Joseph has been sold into slavery, at this point in the story begins to mourn the loss of his son. He's dead and gone as far as he's concerned. Now, this is where our story picks up. We're in Genesis chapter 39, and I'll read a couple verses here and press pause and we'll go back and look at a few things. This is what the scripture says. Now, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt and Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. Verse two, the Lord was with Joseph. Five words. The Lord was with Joseph. Would you say that with me? The Lord was with Joseph. Joseph, it's so important that you hear that. So, that he prospered. And he lived in the house of Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, note that, Potiphar saw in the way that Joseph lived that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did. Joseph found favor in his eyes. Say the word favor. He found favor in his eyes. And he became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted him to his care. Everything that he owned from the time he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food that he ate. Now, how rough must it be when the only concern you have day in and day out is this, what am I gonna eat for supper? Man, think about that for a moment. Now, You know, anytime you read the word, anytime we read the story, right? Like you go through Genesis 37, that's crazy. He gets sold into slavery. Over here in Genesis 39, the story picks up and and, and, and all of a sudden he finds favor and, and you see that the Lord is with him. So we read it and it's just like one fluid sentence. It's like one story. But we omit breath. We omit days. There is a time period that all of this is playing out. Do you know From the moment that he's beaten, that he's thrown into a well, that his brothers have a meal while Joseph is down in a hole, they're laughing, they're eating, they're like, what do we do with Joe? They sell him into slavery. 
from that moment to the moment that he finds favor in Potiphar's house, one year. 12 months, a solid year that he is moving through this place in his life where he's trying to figure out, whoa, wait, wait. God just gave me a vision. God gave me a dream. Why did this happen? He is with a group of people. He doesn't understand their language. He doesn't understand their dialect. For one year, he's moving in the situation. You know, if anybody could play a card of anger, of bitterness, if anyone could play this pity card, Joseph's got the biggest card of anyone in the world. But yet, what do we know? It's so important that we stop and that we see in this season of his life, we see these words, and the Lord was with Joseph. You ever been there? You ever been in that place where maybe everything is, is just, it doesn't make sense? There's circumstances, there's something in your life, and, and you go, and the Lord is with me, but there's part of you that's going, wait, really? Like, God, if, if you're here, I have no idea where you are. You know, I, I heard this speaker at this conference this week. He spoke Friday morning. His name is Ernie Johnson. Have you heard of him? He's a commentator, he works at TNT. In fact, I saw him, he was, he was speaking at this basketball game on Thursday night in Atlanta and he hopped in a car and drove to Nashville. He was there Friday morning and he spoke to all the pastors and he's, he's kind of known for wearing this bow tie and it's like, I told Brent Parker, sports guy, I was like, I like this guy so much, I may actually start watching basketball. He has this incredible story of faith of how the Lord just grabbed him. He said that, you know, I kind of grew up and, and, and I found success early on in my life. He said, my father, he played sports and, and, and I just kind of fell into commentating and doing play-by-play -play. And, and the next thing you know, I'm married and I've got my kids and, and everything's just great. He said, by all means, the world would look at me and see successful. But he said, there was something in me that said, there has to be something more has to be something more. There's something in his soul that said, I'm, I'm missing something. And he said that something was Jesus Christ. And he gave his life. I love that he said, it was October 10th, 1991. He said he was at this church and, and the pastor laid it out and he just said, you know what? I stood up and I went down to the front and I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and personal savior. He said, that was the thing. That was the thing that I was missing. But not long after that, he was diagnosed with cancer. And he said, are you kidding me? Like, everything was great. I had everything going great in my life, and all of a sudden, here's cancer? Like, God, where are you? And he just talked about how all of a sudden he was just angry. He was mad at God. In fact, he said on Friday, he said, you know what? I just wanted to punch God in the nose. And there were pastors. We all went, oh, like that's, you know, that feels really wrong to say. But let's be honest, Jacob wrestled with God. How many of us have not been in that place in our lives where something happens, something happens in the brokenness of the world and we're like, I'm sorry, God, where are you? Because I don't think you're here in this place where I am anymore. And he said he was mad. And he went and he sat down and he talked to a pastor and he was just talking and talking and talking and talking. And he said his pastor looked at him and said three words that changed his life. His pastor said this, trust God, period. He said, what are you talking about? He said, well, it seems like your relationship with the Lord is kind of based on, okay, I'll follow you as long as X, Y, Z, fill in the blank here. Like as long as, as this relationship goes great, I'll follow you. As long as there's no conflict in my life over here, I'll follow you. As long as everything is sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows, I am great, I am all in. But if anything goes wrong, I'm out, Lord. And this pastor said, bro, that's not it at all. It's trust God, period. That's it. You know one of the biggest questions that, that I get, I mean, I don't wanna speak for all pastors, but I, I'll say it's probably one of the big questions that we all get, and it's this, what's God's will for my life? What's God's will? Like, how do I know what's coming? Like, how do I know? We're so obsessed with knowing, all right, what's coming tomorrow? What's coming in a week? What's coming in two months? What if this goes wrong? What if I don't get this? Trust God, period. 
Trust God in the now and know that he's standing in tomorrow. Like that's what I think it means when, when we see this phrase, and the Lord was with him, and the Lord was with Joseph. You find that in chapter 39 almost six times, church. Over and over and over. Remember what I said last week. Don't mistake God's silence for his absence in your life. <laughs> I love that it says, and the Lord was with Joseph. And by the way, Note that in the midst of our adversity, when we stand in the midst of these situations, people are watching. Potiphar, his eyes was on Joseph. He saw the blessing of the Lord was on Joseph. And Joseph found favor and Joseph found success. Listen to me. When the Lord is with you, when the Lord is with us, by default, we have success. Not because of what we have or what we drive or what our 401k looks like. It's all great. But what makes us successful is that God is here. He's in your situation and he will never leave you. I love that. Potiphar's eyes are on Joseph. Now, in Joseph's life, at this point, it seems like things are good. He's turning the corner. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Things are great, right? Ah, oh, but here we go. Joseph's story, y'all. Woo. Let me continue. Verse six, now Joseph was well-built and handsome. By the way, let me pray. Anybody, you're well-built and handsome, you have my prayers? What a burden that must be. <laughs> well-built and handsome. George Clooney, Brad Pitt, these guys. Man, I pray. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and after a while, by the way, I wonder if Joseph wrote that. Hey, why don't we add in there that I was well-built and handsome? <laughs> <laughs> and after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. There it is. Temptation. If ever there's a place in his life that he could go, you know what? I earned this. Isn't it amazing? Like all the way back when you go into the, the garden story in Genesis, Satan is so crafty. <laughs> That whisper is there. Why do you think that fruit is really so bad? Really? Is it really gonna kill you? Is it really that bad? What a dangerous place to be. You know what Abraham Lincoln says? <laughs> I wrote this quote down. I thought this was good. He said, nearly all men can withstand adversity, but if you wanna test a man's character, give him power. Give him power. There's times that that there's that knock on your door. There's times that that thing is presented, that friend request has come along, that, that situation has presented itself, and, and you know it's wrong, but yet it's so enticing. What do you do? I love what Joseph says. I love what he says. Listen to me. He refused, verse eight. He said, with me in charge, he told her, my master doesn't concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has trusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you're his wife. He looks at her and he points at Potiphar and he goes, look at this place that he put me in. Look at all this authority that he gave me. But it's not Potiphar. That's his motivation. Look at what he says. Here's the key. How then could I do such a wicked thing against God? Knowing that the Lord is with me, trust God, period. Why on earth would I go in that direction? So here's what he does. And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. <laughs> you know what the word is there? It's flee. Don't entertain it. Don't crack the door and allow it to come in. It starts subtle, temptation does. It starts subtle. But let me tell you something. If you go down that path, it's a dangerous, dangerous path. Paul speaks about this all throughout the, Old, uh, the New Testament. Like I love that Paul says in 2 Timothy, he says, flee the desires of your youth. The, the message version says this. It says, run away from infantile injustices. <laughs> I love that. You run away from the desires of your youth, but you run to these things. Pursue righteousness, 
Pursue faith, love, peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. He says in 1 Corinthians to the church of Corinth, he says, you stand firm on the foundation of Jesus. And when you stand firm, when you close those doors, when you don't entertain the temptation, (laughs) that's how you keep yourself from falling. And he says, listen, no temptation has overtaken you except what's common to mankind. And God is faithful. God is faithful. I love that in the midst of this temptation and knowing that temptation is real, that Paul would just drop that little phrase right in there. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Joseph took the high road. Let me tell you, when we step out, God steps up every single time. Don't be deceived, church. Don't be deceived. So you know the rest of the story. I don't have time to read the whole chapter to you, but the rest of the story is he does the right thing. He holds on to his integrity like she would actually grab him, grab his tunic. Now, when you'd wear like a tunic, your tunic was your outer robe, but it was kind of your main robe. I don't think you'd have a lot underneath it. So she actually finds him every single day, pursues him. And there's this one moment in Genesis 39 where she grabs his tunic. She's got him by the back and she's like, lay with me. And the only way he can break her grip is to slip out of his clothes and to run away as fast as he can. And if you're thinking it, I'll affirm it. First case of streaking right there. Genesis 39. Get out of there as quick as you can. I love that. I was talking to a friend in Nashville, uh, Jason McAnally, he's a pastor of a church there, and uh, he is so much more spiritual than I am because we were talking about this moment, and, and I said, you know, like, first case of streaking. He's like, well, there's that, but did you also think about this? He said, this is the second time Joseph has had something, a piece of clothing stripped off of him. Think about that. In Genesis 37, it was the coat of many colors. It was almost the favor that his father had given him was completely ripped away. And in this moment, someone tried to rob him of his integrity. She would go to Potiphar and she would hold on to that tunic and say, he tried to have his way with me. What are you gonna do now? Because she couldn't get what she wanted. And you know what Potiphar did? He was pushed into a corner and the only thing he knew what to do was to take Joseph and to throw him in prison for something he didn't do. Took the high road, and there he is for a second time, another garment taken from him, another time he's thrown underground. And you know how 39 ends? With a phrase that maybe you've heard before, and the Lord was with Joseph. Don't mistake God's silence for his absence. And that's exactly where we're gonna pick up next week. But I, I wanna tell you, like Proverbs 3, 5 came to my mind this week. My prayer for you is that you just come to a place where you can put your faith in who God is and not, not what he's done, right? Just to understand, trust God, period. Like Proverbs 3, 5. Proverbs 3, 5 says this. It says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Trust God, period. There it is. Trust in the Lord, not in your circumstances, not in your situations, not in the brokenness or the hopelessness that you see in the church or in the world today. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Maybe something's going on and you didn't ask for it. And maybe you're mad this morning and you're bitter this morning and maybe you're like, God, I don't know where you are. Lean not on your own understanding. Know that wherever you are, I'm telling you, the Lord is with, insert your name here, and in all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. In other words, keep your eyes on the Lord. I promise you, that's exactly what Joseph was doing. I was reading this story, and I'll close with this, this story that I'd never heard before. Um, it's about a guy by the name of, of Dan McConchie. He um, is now serving uh, on the Senate in Illinois, but he has this incredible story. In 2007, he was, he was riding on this motorcycle. He was at an intersection, and this car came barreling through. He was involved in a hit and run, and it would hit him, and it would throw him and his motorcycle into the path of incoming traffic, and he was hit. It was a terrible, terrible accident. 
And he woke up two weeks later and he was in a level one trauma center and he had six broken ribs, he had a deflated left lung, he had a broken clavicle, he had a broken shoulder blade, he had five broken vertebrae. And, and the doctor, when he came due, uh, gave, gave him this word, said, listen, um, you've got a spinal cord injury and, and you are never gonna walk again. I'm so sorry to tell you, you're never gonna walk again. Another person had a relationship in the Lord and found himself in this situation. It was a full month before he was able to leave his hospital room to get a nurse to take him down to the chapel. And he said, I sat in that chapel and I just prayed. I said, God, I want to walk. I want to dance at my daughter's wedding. Father, I want to be able to stand on my feet. I want a healing that no one can explain. And he said, I, I, can't, I can't explain it, but I can tell you this, he said. He said, in, in, in that chapel, I didn't get an answer, but what I got was I got peace. I had peace. The peace I'd never felt before. And to this day, it's interesting. Like unlike Jeanette at the beginning, he's in a wheelchair. To this day, he's not able to walk, but, but it's what he said. Like I read this in the Washington Post, and it's, it's, the, it's what he said. It's like his reaction to the situation that, that Rock me. He said, what I learned is that this life, it isn't for our comfort. But instead, the purpose of this life is that we become conformed to the image of Christ. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen when everything is unicorns and rainbows. It instead happens when life is tough, when we're forced to rely upon God through prayer just to make it through the day. That is when he is most at work in our lives, molding us into who he has designed us to be. Isn't that incredible? He said, my prayers are different today than they were eight years ago. Back then, I looked at God like Santa Claus. I asked him to send nice things my way, but now I have one prayer that I pray more than any other every single day, and it's this. Lord, may I be able to say at the end of today that I was faithful. May I be able to say at the end of every day that more than anything else, no matter what the future holds, no matter what's in store for me tomorrow, may I be able to just say when my head hits the pillow tonight, Lord, I was faithful. Listen, it's hard. That's what Joseph's story tells us today. That's what I find in the pages. I don't know about you. I find that I'm surrounded by people that I love that have cancer. I find that I'm sitting in hospital rooms and, and there's just such such heartbreaking situations and people are like, why? I don't always have the why, but I know the who. I know that God is here. I know that he's still bringing about restoration. So wherever you are in your life, you know the beauty of what Jesus had to say to us time and time again. The book of Matthew opens with Emmanuel, God with us as Jesus comes into the world. And the last thing Jesus says to his disciples is what? And lo, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the age. So to you I say, trust God, period. Lean not on your own understanding, and the Lord is with me, and in all of your ways acknowledge him. And he will, listen to me, he will make your path straight. So I wanna pray for you. Would you just, uh, would you bow your heads and, and let's pray? I wanna pray for those that, Maybe they find themselves today just really struggling. Maybe your heart is broken today. Maybe there's a wound, maybe it's a fresh wound or, or, or maybe it's just something that happened to you and it's a long time ago and that wound is just holding on to you and, and it's, it's, it's just choking the life out of you. And maybe you so long to just breathe again, to be able to have joy again. Maybe the enemy has just wrapped you up and made you believe that you're gonna be in this dungeon for the rest of your life. Listen to me. The Lord is with you. He's there. So Father, I pray, I pray over my brothers and sisters in this space today. I pray over those who hear my voice. 
Father, I believe there are people like Jeanette, God, that you, you're just, you're sending your angels out all around the world. And I think every single day, scripture says your mercies are new. I believe every single day you place someone, some blessing, some, some morsel of hope, God, into our lives that we would be open and aware to receive. And God, maybe there are those today that are on top of the mountain, Lord, that, that, that we know that you're here. God, I pray that you would keep our eyes open. Scripture says the harvest is plentiful. That tells me, Lord, that when Facebook, when the, the world is shouting out that, that the church is broken, that it's beyond restoration, that, that God, the harvest is plentiful. There are people out there. God, you're doing a good work, but the workers are few. So Lord, I'm asking right now that you would raise us up to be fully present in the lives of others. That Lord, we could share hope where there's hopelessness. That we could share the joy that you're here, even in ways we see and in ways that we don't. And Father, for the soul in this room today, maybe they have everything that the world desires to give, but they don't have you. Lord, that they would give their lives to you today. Just be bold. To say, I may not have the answers, but I know this, Father. I believe that you loved me. I believe that you came for me. I believe, God, that you desire my heart. So, Jesus, we lay it at your feet. We love you. We praise you. And it's in your name. It's in your name that we say, amen.